So I want to start by thanking you for coming on my podcast. Whenever I see someone who disagrees with me publicly, I usually will reach out to them and invite them on, but very few people ever take me up on that. So very happy to get the chance to speak with you. Um, so for people listening, I put out a tweet saying, if someone is critical of my work, I invite them to come on my podcast to debate and discuss. And Vosh tweeted, I would be absolutely delighted to come on and discuss your work. So here we are. I know you are a big fan of mine. You posted a video <laughs> on your YouTube channel titled Transphobe Debunks Herself on the Joe Rogan Experience in response to one of my appearances on Joe's podcast. So my goal in having you on is to hopefully build some bridges. I do think the culture war is especially polarized right now. And I think, especially on the issue of gender, and I think sometimes a face-to-face -face conversation can really help to build some understanding. Um, so I thought we'd go through a list of topics that we potentially disagree on. And if you feel I've missed anything, I'll leave some time at the end so you can bring those up. Absolutely. And thank you very much for having me on. I uh, really appreciate it. I have a bit of a hay fever at the moment, unfortunately, because of the um, because of the spring. I'll try to keep my audio clear, you know, muting if I ever have to clear my throat, just letting you know. Okay. No worries. I have the same thing. I'm a little bit flushed right now. So if anyone watching is wondering why, that's why. <laughs> I feel your pain. So first thing, is gender a social construct? Uh, yes, absolutely. And what is your evidence for that? Well, if we acknowledge that sex and gender are distinct categories, which of course, you know, we invent the words, we can decide their meanings if we choose to, with sex being a biological distinction, you know, uh, highly bimodal, of course, with distributions ranging strongly towards male or female with some intersex people, uh, and gender as a collection of social rules and expectations associated with sex. Um, I think that the social construction becomes clear when we attempt to discreetly categorize these distinctions. Very much like race, which is broadly accepted to be a social construct, no one denies that there are biological elements to race. White people have, of course, lighter skin on average than uh, black people. It's been known to happen. Uh, but where we draw those lines, you know, well, do we separate North and South Africans? You know, is the Mediterranean a distinct racial category? That's a social thing. Likewise, for the longest time, we've decided there are two genders here in the West, you know, social categories distinguished exclusively by sex. But of course, there are other cultures where that's simply not the case. There have been cultures where there are third genders or, you know, broader paradigms. India has a legally recognized third gender with more than a billion people in that country. I'd say their perspective is worth something. Um, it's not to say it's not informed by biology only that it's not solely determined by it. There is a social construction there. Right. So I'd ag I agree with you in that I don't think gender is entirely biological, but I would say biology plays a larger role than social con or the socially constructed aspect of it. And I think those of us who argue in favor of biological explanation, sometimes people will take that to mean that we don't think society plays any role at all. And I, in my case, I definitely say that's not true. My perspective in saying that biology plays a role is it does go back to the prenatal environment. Actually, let me start by saying I do agree with you that sex and gender are different things. I don't think they're necessarily the same. I do think they're linked for most people, but they're not necessarily the same. So obviously, if, with transgender people, their sex and their gender are not the same. But for the vast majority of us, over 99% of us, that is the case. So I want to clarify that. But in terms of the biological aspect, uh, in terms of what someone, what, what is considered masculine or feminine in society may be socially constructed or socially imposed, but whether someone gravitates to what's considered masculine or feminine is dictated by biology in terms of the prenatal environment and in terms of testosterone exposure. I definitely right? think you, there's a truth to that. Do you agree with that? Okay. Uh, certainly. Though what is masculine and feminine, of course, can vary massively culture to culture. You know, like in Imperial China, there was a practice of women binding their feet to make them all small. And, you know, I can understand from a biological perspective how a fetishization of petiteness in women could be a kind of uh, recurring theme throughout different cultures. But suffice to say, I don't think that's a recurring trend we see nowadays, say, for example, in 
you know, modern LA, you know, the practice of feet binding, making no. people look like <laughs> I hope not. It was pretty unhealthy back then. Um, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, maybe it is, you know, God knows these days. But uh, so, you know, maybe there are the hormone washes that you undergo um, in vitreo, I, I think affect significantly what your preferences in life are going to be on later. But a lot of that feeds into a sort of cultural preconception of what it means to be a woman or a man, you know, uh, both in a social and in a biological sense. And I think that people feed into that. It turns into a kind of feedback loop where, you know, you go back a thousand years and people were doing wild stuff to um, demonstrate their masculinity or their femininity, you know, like they wanted to. It felt like a, it was like a, a, a drive. But nowadays we've no such desire. And I think it's it's we, we construct the categories that we're sort of driven to to, to walk within to an extent. Um, and, and that's in a sense, I think it recurs a little bit. So do you, when you say that, do you mean maybe society pushes people to, to veer off to one in one direction or the other? Yeah, I think so. What a masculine man is today. I mean, I don't know, think Vin Diesel. I think many kinds of masculine men, but just think Vin Diesel, right? You know, Vin Diesel is an archetype, wasn't around in ancient Greece, but men were and testosterone was. You know, I think that today there are men with a strong biological predisposition towards achieving something. And when they want that something, they look at media and they say, oh, well, Vin Diesel is a guy I can look at. You know, that's an archetype worth pursuing. That option wasn't available back 2,500 years ago. So maybe there are different avenues. You know, they would look at the le the legends of Achilles. I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, 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 a great scholar of the classics. But it, yeah, I, I think to an extent, you know, um, and maybe the masculinity, the underlying testosterone, the hormone washes, they drive both of those things. But um, obviously we play a huge hand in determining where that road goes. Right. And I do think it's important that people have that ability to choose. Uh, I definitely, by by arguing for or talking about biological explanations for gender, I'm definitely not saying that men and women should be held to stereotypical roles. So um, I know, I think you mentioned in your video about how I, you know, I have a PhD in neuroscience and that is a male typical discipline. And I, I'm definitely not saying I think women should be in the kitchen having babies and you know, not being allowed to have a vocation at all. I just think it's important for us to be able to talk about the reasons why there are these sex differences. On average, again, it doesn't say anything about any individual person because my, my, you know, my goal with anything I do in my work as a journalist is to just try to provide people with information and let people decide what they want to do with it. But my, my concern is when I feel that information is being hidden from people because I think that can sometimes work against people in, in terms of their ability to make informed choices. Of so course. your point about, pardon? Oh, no, I was saying, of course. Uh, since okay. since that video that I watched some time ago, I've, I've taken the time to read up on a quite a bit more of your work to, to gain a broader understanding of your perspective. Um, though, of course, you know, the Joe Rogan appearance is quite a publicity boost. So that was the first time I saw you. Right. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, so your point about race, um, I'm curious to understand because I'm sure people in my audience, when they hear race is a, a social construct, they'll say what? And and so that's that was initially my um, my first reaction as well. But I'm curious to hear. So when you say I, I agree with you in terms of how we differentiate among the races, to some extent, that the, that classification is a little bit arbitrary. But are there not some biological correlates, say, with medical predisposition differences that are that do that do link to biology? Of course, uh, I think a good example would be um, uh, sickle cell anemia for, uh, for mm -hmm. West Africans. I believe there are definitely some dispositions, uh, though a lot of them are more cultural than people might think. For example, the lactose intolerance difference between Western Europeans versus like um, Southeast Asians, I think, can be attributed at right. least in large part to the availability of and cultural predisposition to lactose products over the you know centuries and the gut bacteria we build up. Um, when biologists study what we call colloquially race, they talk about clines, you know, hundreds of discrete uh, genealogical spectrums that range geographically across the globe, you know. Um, and what we talk about when we say race, you know, in a broader sense, really is just determined by skin color and maybe a couple of facial features, 
that people's eyes tend to draw to, because that's what we can see, what we can identify. But those are actually really bad markers for genetic differentiation. So if you were really studying um, in, in depth how humans are constructed, it's mostly geographic. You know, you take somebody from one part of the world, move them to the other. In a couple hundred years, their children are going to be much more genetically similar to the people of that environment, you know, uh, just as a product of a ton of factors, you know, related to culture and environment temperature and what have you. Um, and it's just, it's so infinitely complicated. We see so little of it. And I feel in a way, gender is kind of similar. You know, we have these social constructions, but there are many different types of men, right? You know, um, mm -hmm. I grew up in, uh, or right next to West Hollywood, which is a thriving gay community. And, um, <laughs> <Hooray. laughs> right. And, and, and when you're, um, near gay communities, you notice there's, um, I wouldn't call it a binary, but there's definitely a strong divide between, um, some of the more masculine uh, and some of the more feminine men uh, and, you know, the whole dating rituals that go along with it. You know, I'm into men, so, you know, it's, it, to, to a degree of, you know, participated in this. Um, and it's not at all difficult to imagine a society in which that could have been categorized as a third gender. You know, you have masculine men or tops or what have you, and, you know, they're categorized in one direction. Then you have the other, you know, more bottomy feminine men and people would have, it would have been a gender trinary, you know, and people would have found ways to get angry about that. Um, but we, mm -hmm. you know, we, we construct a lot of this stuff. I encourage people to be, um, I suppose, open-minded to the idea that things could have been different. Right. And so your point about, uh, third gender cultures, like in India, the Hijra, um, in my book, the end of gender, I talk about the Fafa Fine, which are uh, third gender culture in Samoa. So, in terms of, I, I'm I'm trying to follow how this leads to gender being socially constructed. Just basically where we di where we differentiate between what's a man versus someone who's in between male and female versus what's female is is that what you mean by it's, it's socially like third genders lead to that conclusion to you? Well, because you could um, you could decide to draw these lines anywhere, even if you were to presume that gender has to be something associated with roles. Um, constructed by sex you know to an extent or like how people relate socially to their sex um if people relate to their sex in different ways a la you know bottoms and tops in the gay community you can make a strong argument that these are fundamentally different gender roles a strong one you know socially uh the line between gay bottoms and gay tops i think is actually a pretty strong and recurring one culturally in a lot of places you know in the pre-colonial i think philippines um there was a social role I think it was accepted as a kind of third gender where um, more feminine, you know, men or, or born as males, whatever term you want to use, you know, were sort of socially integrated into the role of women. That's actually, I think, a third gender in a good number of cultures where you have yeah. men who take on the role of women. And that's a very broad, you know, thing there, but sort of generally speaking. And we could do that. And to do that, to make that third um, construction would not in any way... Um, invalidate our broader understanding of gender we would just decide to cut the lines a little differently uh much as we have with race you know the biological clients the continuum has been present in human history you know for, forever it's it's our biological diversity uh, but um where we draw those lines very different in the roman days than today and that ultimately is just up to what we care about what preferences we decide to uh, uh act on yeah, because I, I guess I see it as, as the most simple ex or the most straightforward way to look at it is just to simply say they're men and they're women. And you know, if there's, there can be deviation within that, but at the end of the day, you're still a man or woman. And if you feel that you identify more so as the opposite, then you are transgender and then transition if that's what you choose in, as an adult. So um, I guess my issue is when people, I'm not saying you do this, but my when I sense that people are trying to reconceptualize things just for the sake of it. Um, but with regard to third gender cultures, um, as you're saying, with regard to gay men in, in say, say with the Hijar or say with the Fafafine, they would be considered gay men if we looked at them from, say, a North American perspective. So that's why when people talk about gender being a spectrum, I think, well, you know, I, I don't think we have to go through and reconceptualize everything in our society um, just to facilitate acceptance. I think we can say, you know, there are people who are different. They're gay people, um, they're transgender people, they're intersex people, but for the vast majority of us, 99% of us plus, we are men or women and we identify as our birth sex. So I see that as the most simple, straightforward way to do it. Sure, but we shouldn't limit the range of human expression based purely on simplicity.
Just because we have a preference towards our gender binary system doesn't mean it's inherently any more valid. I'm fine with social deconstructionism in a variety of ways, uh, so long as it's serving, you know, the, the idea that it benefits humans, that it makes us happy. And as far as I can tell, both today and the modern world and uh, across a variety of cultures, it wasn't sufficient to simply say, oh, well, this person's a feminine man or what have you, you know. Um, as we construct these categories, as we delineate where we decide to draw these lines, um, the only real concern, to, at least to me, is what makes people happy, you know? We're not really talking about hurting people here. Um, when we reconceptualize these ideas, people often talk about this, you know, the destruction of the gender binary. Well, you take non-binary people and I ask, what harm is being done? Um, certainly nothing that can be measured in a graph. It's this ephemeral, well, what of our traditions? And I don't really care about those. Um, I just care about freedom, really. I'm a libertarian socialist. The idea of people being able to identify how they want to choose their life's path and the terms they use to describe those. As far as I'm concerned, as long as nothing's unscientific, nothing contradicts factual reality, and nothing hurts other people, then it should be fair game. And of course, I don't think anyone's contradicting the underlying... Um, the biological nature of things, you know, sex, the uh, gametes, you know, difference between this hormone and that hormone. I think um, as long as those basic tenets of reality remain um, consistent, then the identity part, I mean, go hog wild. I don't really care where people go with it. Right. And I, I agree with you in that. I think people should be free to express themselves however they like and be happy and live their life and not be bothered by other people or not be judged. My concern is when people are making these decisions and they are potentially leading, especially young people, to make decisions about modifying their body that may be permanent or may be potentially harmful to them or that they may regret. So with regard to, say, non-binary, um, and I will use the pronouns someone wants me to use, um, the same with, with, say, people who are transgender, when I say transgender, I'm, I'm referring to people who identify as the opposite sex. And I know that some people might say non-binary is the same as transgender, but I, I do make that difference. But um, my, with regard to non-binary, what, what is the evidence for this idea that there are, there's a third gender? Is it, are you referring to third gender cultures or is there, uh, is there additional evidence that you're thinking of? Well, the evidence for it is simply that there's no greater argument for the system that we have than any culture which has a third gender or had one in the you know pre-colonial days, which of course was much more common in the pre-colonial days um, before our values became homogenized a bit. Um, and this isn't really a, a scientific or evidentiary thing, really. It's social construction. It's theory, really, gender theory, which people mock, of course. You know, people roll their eyes at it. But um, there's some really fascinating and complicated stuff behind the uh, behind the wheel there. And I like to use allegories to race because the discourse around racial abolition and the social construction of race hasn't been as politicized as that with regards to gender. You know, if you go back a hundred years. Um, you know, the Irish were considered the um, the N words of of Europe. I believe was a was a mm -hmm. common you know derogatory term. Now, of course, they didn't think that Irish people were biologically identical to Northern African people, um, but there was uh, an understanding that they were somehow lesser within the category of white. Same with Italians, though, to I believe a lesser extent. And really, the arguments back then. They, they attempted to post hoc justify it scientifically, but the arguments back then were fundamentally a social one, you know, what is or is not whiteness? And if you include Irish people, do you include, say, Mediterraneans, Greek people? What about Turkish people? You know, how far south along the Mediterranean? How far clockwise can you go before that becomes a problem? There's no real answer. Um, and to me, being that I'm both a racial and gender abolitionist, my understanding is that given that there are no real answers, there's no real right or wrong, there's only human happiness, we should cast aside categories which do harm and adopt those which minimize it. And this stringent fixation on, well, how can you prove this, that, or the other with gender? Well, we can't really prove anything with it. We know there are social roles and categories associated with sex, but those roles and categories change. The lines around them change and have changed historically. I don't know if any factual argument could be made in any direction. Well, in terms of why there are only two genders, as you mentioned, if sex is determined by gametes and gender identity is determined by biological sex for over 99% of us, then 
where is the third gamete that would suggest there is a, a gender in between men and women? Because it's only determined female. for ninety nine percent of us. For, well, first of all, you know, even if it was just the ninety nine percent, the existence of one percent constitutes millions of people. Um, but you know, even within that, we constructed the categories to perfectly match sex. So of course, there's going to be a near one to one correlation with sex. But if we were to have, say, for example, uh, the masculine and the feminine men being bisected into two categories of men, two genders within what we now consider to be one, well, then all of a sudden it gets more complicated. But you're deferring to simplicity in a system which is aesthetized for simplicity, um, which I, I mean, it, it's sort of a recurring pattern. You know, we've 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 built something to correlate perfectly to sex, so of course it's going to correlate near perfectly to sex. The historical conception of gender and sex is that there is no distinction for the most part, um, at least in the West, that, you know, it's just your roles are because of your sex. And the idea that the roles might be some kind of separate construction is something that, at least for the past few hundred years in Western antiquity, we haven't really engaged with that much. Well, what do you mean by your roles would be different from your sex if the vast majority of men behave in one way and the vast majority of women behave in another way, and this is driven by biological underpinnings? How is that socially constructed? There's, you, some, there's a piece that I'm missing here. Are you, under, are you of the opinion that um, color is socially constructed? Do you mean vis like visual color? Visual color, means? the optical perception, yes. Socially constructed? As far as I know, it's it's a biological process. I, I agree. It's a, you know the wavelengths that we see. Of course, you have people with vision abnormalities which see different colors. But right. you know we 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 under, we have an understanding of what a properly working eyeball can see, and we have a good understanding of what wavelengths correspond to which you know subjective experiences of color. Um, but of course, if you take a look at the history of color and language across the world, different cultures have different conceptions of what is or isn't green or blue. There's no hard line, of course, between what a green or a blue is. It's totally arbitrary. Um, it's literally a spectrum. Uh, so the line is drawn um, differently depending on the linguistic preconceptions of the culture that you're looking at. For the most part, we've sort of nailed out the ideas here. But if you take a look historically, like uh, which ideas of color develop first, where are these lines drawn, you get really interesting and very diverse ideas. And of course, this is, I mean, this is factual. This is biological. Um, the color wavelength is something that we can measure out and parse mathematically. So it's not like we're exclusively dealing with subjective human experience. And yet, the categories we draw, how many colors are there in the wheel? Are there five, eight, ten? We say they're functionally infinite, but we only have so many words. And most people separate it into a discrete range of colors associated with the rainbow. At least that's the historical archetype that people draw towards most easily. But that doesn't include all the colors. It doesn't include purple, for example. Um, I guess the point that I'm getting at here is that there's not a contradiction between a biological underpinning and a complete arbitrariety of the overlying concept. You know, it's like uh, the biology is the foundation, but the house you build atop it is um, very much of your own design. I can see that to some extent, but with vision, it's still, I mean, perception is still to some extent, it's not as subjective to me as how you feel about your gender. So say with gender fluidity for people, my understanding of people who shift between male and female or are both or neither, and this can change throughout the day, that is purely subjective in terms of their self-report of that, right? It's not marked in anything objective. And that's where I have an issue with it because to me, it just always comes back to what is evidence-based, what's in the data. When people start straying from that, it makes me wonder, well, why and what, what is the purpose of that? And it's fine if it's fine if people just want to say how, that's how they feel. But when they start to say that this is what science shows, when it doesn't, that's my concern. Well, I don't think people speak to science there. People who talk about gender expression are talking about subjective experience because the social roles are what they're talking about. You know, if people were fussing about with the biology of sex, that's your one thing. But, you know, I, I mean, you can ask people, uh, take a, five people with different shades of blue on their shirts. And you ask, you put them in a room, how many color shirts are being worn today? Will you get an answer of five distinct for subtle color shades? One, two, or will people say that it's all the same shirt color fundamentally? Um, it can even change depending on the time of day. You know, some people say their eyes are blue when they wake up and green when they fall asleep. A lot of that's a trick of the light, but 
That's a perceptive thing. And of course, gender being a construction of social expectation is itself to an extent a perceptive thing. I guess at the end of the day, I think that um, the, the, the fixation with scientific categorization with something as arbitrary as gender will be seen in the long run as obsolete as what we've done with race. Nowadays, biologists speak of clients, the actual underlying genealogical threads, not the overlying categories. Um, and uh, I think that uh, for the most part, biologists are doing the same now with sex, where they're recognizing sex itself, even as a, as a bimodal biological construct determined by a variety of um, underlying threads. And the gender stuff, I think, we should, we should just leave to the purview of social identity. I have as much interest, I think, in the scientific legitimacy of a person being a woman in a gender sense as them being a gamer you know, or a, or a pothead, you know, you could measure perhaps some genealogical association, but um, I think it's an identity first and foremost and should be treated as such. Hmm. I think it's, I think we just have very different ways of, of wanting to understand phenomena in the world. And so your point about, um, you just made a point there about, about sex being bimodal. So the thing with sex and gender, I don't consider them to be spectra or to be um, continua because most people fall predominantly as one or the other, right? If it were a spectrum or a continuum, people would fall at any point along the way with equal probability. But what you see is most people are male or female. And then you have a small segment of people who say are they are in between or say with intersex people but intersex we can talk about as well um but i in that case i don't think we should be reconceptualizing society for the sake of a small minority i think we can we can advocate for them and equal rights for them without having to reconceptualize everything well something doesn't have to be um uh equal distribution for it to be a spectrum but it's really just a spectrum of different characteristics there are sexual characteristics, of course, which vary to the extent that you'll have, um, you know, males and females overtake each other. Height, for example, being one of those characteristics where the majority of men are taller than the majority of women. There are, of course, overlap um, quite a bit of it with regards to that. You have more concrete categories like uh, chromosomes, um, you know, gametes and what have you. Um, but even then, you have variances sometimes. The intersex category includes a variety of uh, conditions which might lead a person to have a normal representation in those fields. Um, but, a, you know, a binary has two options, um, not two with a range in between. And I don't really think that this is of much interest to people outside of, you know, um, biological experts. I don't think any social reengineering is being done around the idea that sex is complicated. Of course it is, you know, we're biological machines. We're unimaginably complicated. We couldn't build one of us um, if in a lab, if we wanted to, you know, we need the, the help of one our day. own machines. One day, God willing. Um, so given all that complexity, the idea that sex would be this very complicated and, and, and you know, extremely spectral, not spectral, like on a spectrum um, concept, isn't that you know, alien to me. But I don't think that gets talked about that much, you know. Even with the trans stuff, it's really just a gender thing. You know, trans women don't go around arguing that they're biologically the same as cis women. If they did, then they wouldn't want to transition, of course. You know, there's an acknowledgement of an underlying uh, you know, biological distinction. But I see, so again, I don't think that the most vocal trans activists necessarily speak for everyday transgender people or everyday, the average trans woman. But I have seen some activists saying, that they are biologically female or they are biologically male because they identify as that sex. And I think that has implications for society more broadly because especially in the way that this is being taught to kids, I think for some people, they don't realize that sex is real. It's not, I mean, some people will say that sex is socially constructed. And I th again, I think if people want to have a, a, conversation, a conversation about these ideas and tease them apart as we're doing here, that's great. But when it's actually being taught and spoken about like it's true, there are going to be negative implications of that because it's not true. I can't speak to every uh, trans activist out there, but having been a radical lefty for some time, the only time I can ever remember a person sincerely arguing there's no real such thing as a sex difference, no difference between men and women, trans, cis women, whatever. There's some Reddit thread where they were getting dogpiled by the comments. I don't know if it's something 
held seriously, a position held by many. I can't argue anecdotes with you, of course, but the idea that the trans community or even the trans activists are of that position, I think, is highly overstated, or conflation often held and enforced by conservatives, you know, because trans women will go, well, trans women are women, and conservatives will go, huh, well, how can you be a woman if you have no womb? Which is itself a conflation of the gender-sex divide right there. Trans women aren't saying they have a womb. Um, they don't, to my knowledge, man, you know, maybe somehow some of them do. Um, but uh, to my- I've seen some, but I won't hold you to that, yeah. Right, you know, the vast majority don't, I imagine. The conservatives play that game whereby performatively denying the distinction between gender and sex, they can pretend that trans people are just woefully unaware, delusional, you know, that they're, you know, they somehow seem to believe they're biologically the same as, uh, you know, the cis counterpart. But um, that's, I, I just don't think that's the case. I think that for the most part, especially these days, trans people are increasingly comfortable with uh, the, the, the biological reality of things. The fact that they're not the same as a cis man or a cis woman in terms of, you know, where they'll be even after a, a, a medical transition. Um, and I think that's a wonderful thing, of course, you know. I don't think that a woman just has to have a, a, a womb or what have you, you know, whatever range of biological accoutrement people decide they're happy with, I think is a wonderful thing. I think that's great if that's the case, but I wonder then why is it we don't see more of those voices more prominently? I think we do. Honestly, the only place I see other voices are when they're being signal boosted in conservative discourse. I know that the position that gender is something which is a product of identity of its sex is... Uh, you know, largely binary and, you know, discrete, separate category is held, for instance, by basically every medical association in the West. Um, that um, in terms of the broader activism, I, I mean, I can't speak to every, you know, college professor on TikTok, but um, it, that is definitely the recurring theme here. Um, people who disagree, not to speak this of you or whatever, but broadly, I mean, I would wonder where they're getting their information from because uh, the only place I see otherwise really is... Um, is, is, is these conservative spaces where they're incentivized to elevate the voices they think are worst representatives of their, you know, opposition. Can you say that last point again, in terms of what you feel medical associations generally put out as their messaging? Obviously not every single one, but just as a broad theme. But for the most part, it seems like the sort of the recognition of the validity of trans people. I know the APA, the American Medical Association of, um, American Academy of Pediatrics, I'm sure there's a big list out there somewhere, but um, that broadly they, they affirm the validity of trans people, the idea that gender is something that can be identified with and changed. Um, but I, I don't believe any of these organizations, um, the American, yeah, yeah, I don't think any of them verify the idea that like there's, that sex can just be instantly changed or flipped over, that there's no discrete differences between men and women who are cisgender or transgender. Um, uh, certainly transitioning changes some sex categories, you know, I mean, you can only, you can only inhale so much estrogen before some sexual categorizations, uh, your body adheres to begin to change. But, um, yeah, I just, I just don't think that's very common messaging. So how would you define, what is a woman? Um, I would say that woman is sort of a social archetype that people choose to adopt, um, like a, kind of like an identifier that they want to be known by. Now, obviously, you know, there's a lot of conflation here because people get assigned this, that, the other at birth, which means that you sort of grow up with a set of roles and definitions before you're old enough to have any opinion on the subject, really. Um, but it, at least when we're talking about, you know, gender as an identity, you know, what people care about when they're older, that's what I think of. It's it, like being a woman, you know, what does it mean to be a woman? Um, it's it's how you think of yourself and how you want the world to think of you. It's it's a sandwich board slung around your neck uh, with a set of identifiers that you want to be considered by. I think people do this with a lot of things, not just gender, you know, but I think gender is sort of the big one. So when self-identification, are there any areas in which you think biology should play more of a role than self-identification? Well, if you're talking with your doctor about uh, your propensity for given conditions, you know, I, obviously I think trans people should be upfront with their doctors about the fact that they're trans. Um, outside of that, I just, in, in terms of people's decision making, I, I don't think biology plays that much of a role insofar as it supersedes people's um, right to choose for themselves. You know, obviously biology plays a huge role in a ton of stuff that we do day to day, but, uh, you know, if, if you make the choice to act against the sort of, 
stereotypical categorization down that role, then I think that's fine. I don't really think it hurts anyone to do that. So what about, where should we start? Maybe sports. Do you think with sports, there should be any importance placed on biology or biological differences? Uh, sure. Well, there already has been, of course. Uh, you know, we, we, we separate men and women. Women in the Olympics have that testosterone cap. They're not allowed to exceed, um, which is a interesting can of worms right there. The transports thing is complicated. Um, there's varying evidence here. Obviously, if you take estrogen for long enough, it destroys your muscles. I mean, God, if you've ever seen a trans woman or like arm wrestled one, you can destroy them. You can tear them apart. They're taking bone weakening juice. It's incredible. Um, so, you know, take a few years of that. Nobody's going to be performing as well. Um, there are some products of um, higher androgen sensitivity prior to transition, which carry over post-transition. I think bone density is a big one. Wingspan and height um, are averages that don't um, cleanly, you know, uh, recede back to the average for females. Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's it's a complicated question in terms of the what harm is done, right? Right now, the available existing harm of trans women participating in women's sports is effectively nil. There are We've heard a couple of headlines over the past five or six years, but it's usually like some college athlete does slightly better than expected. Sometimes the trans athlete doesn't even do that well, but people get angry anyway. Um, a couple of times things have, you know, they, they've, they've done better than expected, but um, it's a very minor problem. It's something that I would really rather have depoliticized and focused on by um, sports scientists you know, sports um, uh, medicinal practitioners, because I think they're best qualified to make decisions on this subject. People talk about it like it's some kind of human rights issue, but it was like Utah passed that law. I think it was Utah, but there was like um, one trans athlete in all of Utah or something like that. So they passed a whole statewide bill, um, uh, you know, to, to, to curtail a problem, which essentially doesn't exist. People just get hysterical over this stuff, I think. I agree that they're... Well, I think I'm, I'm probably more concerned about this issue than you, as I've been quite vocal about it. Um, I'm trying to think of the best place to start. Well, okay, with your point about arm wrestling and muscle mass, I don't doubt that there's an effect of taking estrogen, but there has been research to show that even after a year, two years of being on estrogen, that it doesn't change muscle mass or muscle strength. So uh, this is probably not the case for every single trans woman, but I think that's a really important consideration to make, especially if they are going to be competing against women who are born women. And to your point about how this is a very rare phenomenon, I, I see it growing. I mean, yeah, I do think that there is um, a lot of attention placed on when we do see this happening, when there are cases, you know, the media, media really gets on it, but I also worry about the future of women's sports because it elite, even in some sports, elite female athletes do not stand a chance against a non elite male athlete. And there are these differences that are not overridden by taking estrogen or suppressing testosterone in terms of it goes beyond muscle. It's in terms of foundation, like bone length in terms of the angles at which bones uh, connect in the body. Women have a higher uh, propensity for injury as a result of having wider hips. Um, in terms of lung size and heart size, so I, you know, I'm all in favor. I think if it's not in elite sports, I don't have as much of an issue if trans women want to compete in the women's category because I do think I, I can imagine that that sense of belonging and and acceptance is important, but at the elite level, when it can be life-changing for someone to win the competition, especially for these girls who've been training forever for these scholarships, I, I don't think it's fair. And I also don't think it's fair that they can't speak up without being called hateful. Do you, uh, another question actually I have for you I'd is- I'd like to speak on that if I may. Okay, go ahead. Um, every study I've seen indicated that um medical transition weakens the musculature significantly. So I would have to, and I've seen a, a good bit of research on that, so I'd, ha I'd have to see a source there. Um, I guess the issue that I have with this ultimately is that this is an example of a politicization of a problem gone like uh, mad, you know? 
Like so far we have maybe a handful, like an actual five or less count of cases where there's been some kind of upset as a product of trans women and women's sports over the course of this being a cultural issue over the past six years. Um, when we're when we're operating with this number, I mean, this is this is like national outrage over like rare diseases that don't have a name yet. This is such a marginal issue. Now, that's not to say, mind you, that it's not worth consideration or discussion. But we are talking about an issue which has merited a national response. And to be fair, and you know, to to clear aside, and again, not saying this about you, but ninety eight percent of this discourse really has nothing to do with women's sports because most of it's fronted by conservatives. Conservatives don't care about women's sports. They have never cared about women's sports. It has been a long running joke that they don't care about women's sports. It is it, like it, they have admitted they don't care. Like it's just been a chauvinistic, you know, condescending derision for decades and decades. It's about trans people. Um, and this is an issue with it, which is very medically oriented, uh, something that should be left to the science, I feel. But the discourse happening right now has nothing to do with the science. It's this weaponization of a marginal issue in order to direct an attack against a broader community. And you see this play out all the time, you know. Um, in terms of like problems affecting American people, this is so unfathomably far down any list a person could arrive at. I don't mean to say this to diminish the concerns that female athletes might have, you know, um, only to say that the national response, I mean, making this one of the top billing, you know, issues for the Republican Party, I think it, it demonstrates an incredible bias with regards to what issues should be focused on. I mean, there are more cases of Republican legislators being fired for sexual misconduct in the past couple of years than there have been of these trans female athlete upsets combined over the entirety of the time it's been discussed. Where we focus our attention is itself a political decision, one which warrants justification, I think, especially when it's this disproportionate. Well, I would argue this isn't a conservative or Republican issue, because there are definitely Democrats who are concerned as well. And this is, mm. I interviewed Kara Dance, I interviewed Kara Dansky about this for my podcast, and people can go listen to that. And she said, this is going to be the issue that brings the parties together, because this isn't, this is not something, it's not a left or right issue, nor do I think it should be. Um, your point about how there are only five cases, there have definitely been more than five. I mean, I could, count them right now and of upsets because normally it's just a trans woman being in sports that people get upset over but in terms of the overperformance, i think generally they, they they perform well within the lines of expected cis female performance and well, it's, it's win, definitely Republican they win thing. though they win by quite a margin do they not uh, the number of times that trans women have won by quite a margin in sort of college athletics or above is no, for the most part, usually this upset happens before they've won anything. Usually it's just them participating at all. I remember there was that, um, that I think they were a track and field. Um, and, and, and they did a, right, they did a whole documentary. And the trans woman, wasn't she, she came in like sixth or something. The woman who was mad came in eighth or, or ninth. And it was the top eight who were qualifying. And she was mad over that, something like that. It's like, again, if you were to take a look at any other issue, if if this is what unites the parties, then America deserves to burn. We have infrastructural issues. You know, um, we, we can't feed or clothe our people. Our healthcare system is broken. If our party is united, if our parties are united, not over any real issue that affects like the American people, but issues so marginal that you can count on one hand the number of trans athletes per state, I think that's really indicative of how much of, of a divide there is between like the cynical political messaging that's used in Washington and what Americans actually need to get by day to day. It's just, I just, I, I can't summon that much because I can just think of any other, like, you know, do the people who claim to care about, um, you know, college women's sports, do they care about like college athletes being exploited, not being paid for their work while the, um, colleges make millions of dollars off of the, uh, you know, broadcasting rights to those games, because that happens to tens of thousands of people every year. No, of course not. It's just, it's the trans athlete thing. And, you know, we get this one well, big story every six months. Can I, can I, can we go to that uh, Connecticut track? So one of the trans girls actually did win first place in the 102 meter dashes. In the initial, wait, one of the, um, uh, are we thinking of the same one? 
Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to say her name just because I don't want people to, to bully this person. I generally just, I don't want people to go after the individual athlete. To me, this is more about the larger trend of what we see happening, right? Well, in terms of, tr oh, wait, there were two. Okay, we might be talking about different ones. Um, the, um, I, I mean, a trend on a national scale would just require more data points. Again, like in, the grand, but, the harm we're talking would, about here is like maybe a couple of cis women of though. Place. That this is they are winning. I, I'm sorry. The idea that you can justify national outrage based on a handful of cisgender women in college placing lower than they might have otherwise is insane to me. Every other problem imaginable is more worth national consideration. If this was just being discussed in academia or like sports science or whatever, I think that's fair game. It's a really interesting subject. And there is, you know reason for concern there but this like like th people act like this is some kind of defining issue like like the the phrase there this will unite the parties why if infrastructure couldn't i mean our bridges are crumbling if healthcare couldn't tens of thousands die if the fentanyl but epidemic i would argue i don't i don't want to cut you off but i would argue that this is just the beginning of some larger this is a huge problem because it's going to be the end of women's sports and i also see what look at what's happening in prisons look at what's happening what's happening in, in prison where people where people are being housed in say hospitals and they're being women are now vulnerable to sexual assault as Wait. a result of this because Wh people are self-identifying where's the evidence women. of that happening uh, of the hospital in the UK, there was a case of a woman who was on a women's ward and she reported a rape and they said, oh, that didn't happen because there are only women on this ward. And then they went back and they actually found through security footage that there was actually a trans woman staying on the ward during that time. And so this woman had indeed been allegedly raped. And so I'm not saying that a trans women a... are predators. Well, but this is this is something that also... we're seeing this much more is going to be much more common well, with respect absolutely not not with, of trans women but of men of men abusing the ability to identify as women this is, to get this access is fear to victims and this is one of the issues that i take with you you talk about science i ask you where's the evidence you give me an anecdote where's the evidence of this well what, it will what happen. was the anecdote though that one this instance is, this was of reported the, in the news this was reported in, rape, in the news. rapes happen everywhere one instance is not an evidence of a pattern. And by the way, England up until recently had a very prejudiced law where rape could only happen uh, through penetration. Um, nothing else was counted rape, you know? So if you're a man, you know, you, you rape a woman, that can be counted. But there are cis women who have raped cis women in England, and it wasn't counted as rape because none of the available equipment was present. Um, the idea well, that I believe I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, mm -hmm. I see we're coming so close on time and if there's so many things for us to talk about. So I, can I just say that I think that, say with prisons, especially this is happening. It's what it happened in England. It's happening in Scotland. It's happening in California. I'll tell you this much. We don't have evidence that letting trans women into cis women's prisons will increase sexual assault. To my knowledge, there's no evidence of that upticking in an actual, like, here's a percentage, then here's a change percentage sense. We do know that trans women who go to men's prison are like nine times as likely to be raped. So purely from a harm reduction perspective, and this goes the same with the bathrooms and the hospitals and what have you, putting trans women in the same spaces as men is demonstrably dangerous whereas putting them in the same spaces as women is circumstantially dangerous so far, only looking at given accounts or one specific bit or another. But does that not matter that women's safety is being placed at risk as a result of that? By putting trans women and, in men's and, prisons? I agree and completely. Why is it, and why is it, but there's socially, it's so unacceptable for women to speak up about this. If they say anything in favor of their own safety, they're deemed transphobic. But there, there's no, literally no evidence at present of it compromising their safety, and there is evidence of it severely compromising the safety of the trans woman, who also but deserve to not be How can be you raped. say there's no evidence when there are women saying that this is happening to them? We see this happening in prisons. Are you a we see this happening Wait, are you a doctor? in terms of, That's not how I'm not you a form. medical doctor. A, a, a I'm not PhD. a medical doctor, but I can I can do statistics. No, 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 no. That's not statistics. Evidence of news cases. I can find news cases of anything happening anywhere. There was okay. There in was order a study in the, argument, in the UK of I'm unisex. Familiar. Oh, sorry, yeah, please. Of unisex 
uh, changing rooms and how this did actually increase. I have it in the end of gender. I can't think of the top of my head, the statistic, but it did actually increase the sexual assaults. That's not trans women and women. That's men and women. But the self-identification aspect opens the door. No, I'm not saying it's trans women who are doing this. I'm saying, but it's opening up the door to the possibility. And I'm, all, I've, I'm totally there with you. I think we do need to have the evidence, right? There should be proper studies done. But how will those studies be done in this climate? Do you, do you think that it would be even possible? Easily. Do you know how outraged people will be that you would even consider that gender self-identification may potentially lead to these outcomes? It's not controversial to study these things in the sociological fields. There's often been a claim from, not to draw a comparison, race realists, people of the position that different races are of different inherent levels of intelligence, that the reason the scientists won't publish the studies, of course they do publish the studies, you know, but this is the narrative, they won't publish the studies is because there's some sort of internal pressure against, you know, like they can't do it, it's, it's the PR is too bad, they won't be allowed to. In reality, sociologists do whatever the hell they want. Um, it would be actually quite trivial to see whether or not instances of documented sexual assault increase significantly after the change of a policy. You could do it without even really tackling the trans. I mean, you wouldn't even have to introduce any discrete categories, only reports. But as of the moment, we're, we're in a situation now where trans women, we know they're far more likely to be abused if they're placed in men's spaces. But we don't know that there's an increase in harm predicated on them being put in women's spaces. And given that environment to me, the idea that, you know, we should just ignore the evidence, ignore the science and go like, oh, well, you know, keep, you know, keep trans women in men's spaces. It's just lunacy to me. I mean, why? What about offenders who identify as male up until the point where they are arrested? Once they go into custody, they identify as female. So these are, say, sex, sexual offenders who have raped women. Mm -hmm who identify as female, they're going to be housed in a women's prison. And then we do see that some of these male born rapists who are housed in women's prisons because they identify as female, then go back to identifying as male once they are released into the community. And I, I for, for people listening, I mean, my audience knows this, but for people who may not be aware, I used to work with violent offenders and sexual offenders. So I do have experience working with forensic populations and this is where my concern is coming from because I know that these people are very antisocial and they will do whatever they have to do to get access to more victims. So does that, does that lead to a pause in your mind in terms of, I, I agree with you and I am concerned about trans women being housed in men's prisons and being at a greater risk of being violated. But I, at the same time, don't think it should be okay. Well then we'll just, anyone who wants to go into the women's prisons or into women's spaces should be allowed to without question. I think it's an interesting hypothetical, um, but one which at moment doesn't bear much statistical relevance. It's, just, it's sort of like the, you know, what about someone faking going into the restrooms or what have you? Though obviously this is a bit more significant because instead you'd be housed in a prison for some time. The question is, to what extent would a person be willing to do such a thing? You know, people have pretty strong attachments to their gender identity. And, you know, as a man, I can't imagine I'd be very comfortable in a women's prison. I mean, you know, if, if you could cartoonify the whole it's thing more posh though it is you. but it's also it's not as though prisons for either sex are particularly accommodating this is a hypothetical concern which i think warrants real discussion i do think there's a legitimate possibility of predation based on these preconceptions but i i, I have to go where the evidence follows or where the ed evidence leads me i suppose i have to follow um and at the moment the greatest concern that we have actual evidentiary claims for is with regards to the safety of trans women um and if it does turn out there ends up being some significant issue of these like um fake you know like rapes going up because of people fake identifying or whatever then i think we should it would warrant examination i imagine the easiest solution would just be to impose the same standards that uh, people do for medical transition which is that you have to live as your gender for a given length of time before they'll allow for um you know stuff like bottom surgery Meaning that if, if, you know, if, if you're a rapist and you've been living as a woman for several years before being arrested, that seems like a fairly compelling bit of evidence right there that you might actually be a woman unless you were anticipating being arrested and being sent to jail, you know, years later after your, your court date finally comes up. Um, or as if you just say like right on the spot, actually I'm a woman, maybe they would disregard that. I'd be interested to see how it plays out. And your point about how sociological research could be done on this. I would say, okay, maybe in some disciplines in which 
there's an expectation as to what they will find with their findings, because I know this was another point that you brought up in the video you did. I, I do not think in this climate, there may be exceptions, but it is extremely difficult for objective researchers and scientists to even pursue questions that go against activism. It's I next to impossible. I don't, I don't think that- act What is that based on? Well, I have a decent number of academic friends and I'm only a bachelor's myself, which is hardly an academic, so I can't speak from personal experience. But oftentimes there's this weird conflation where it's like, the researchers are beholden to the activists, but then somehow the activists are in agreement with almost every major medical institution in the United States. So it's actually the researchers who are the activists, in which case you'd think they wouldn't be beholden to anyone because they're acting ideologically in line with the group you'd expect. Well, I, don't you, I don't want to cut you off. Is it possible that these organizations have also been influenced by the activists? Influenced? Sure but to the extent that it's compromised the validity of their research. No, I think that's conspiratorial. It's a longstanding uh, conspiracy among homophobes that the only reason the APA removed homosexuality from the DSM was because of activist pressure. And that in reality, they all knew being gay is a mental illness and they only took it off because of political pressure, you know, uh, in, the, in the absence of evidence. Um, I can't say so. I think that the research on trans people, the sort of prevailing attitude is consistent across disciplines for a reason. Um, and it's because most of this stuff is, is borderline common sense, you know. I don't think the activists hold much sway in what can or can't be researched. I, <laughs> what would you say to someone who's lost their job as a result of activists harassing them and putting pressure on their institution to fire uh, the person? Uh, well, I know um, Libs of TikTok is doing plenty of that work right now. So if it was a victim of their thing, I'd say I'm sorry for the, the harassment you've gotten. Well, okay, it, but let's let's not make it a, an even across the board thing, right? What, what would you, it's serious. If someone loses their job because they're pursuing research that they are genuine, it's not hateful. They're just genuinely interested in wanting to know what the truth is. And they lose their job because they ask the question. Is that fair? As a socialist, there are plenty of people in my ideological tradition who have legitimately lost their jobs due to the questions they felt worth asking. In my experience, and again, I understand this sounds... And I agree with you across the board politically. I don't think it matters if someone's on the left or right. That shouldn't be happening. I think it matters what they're being fired for. Then lives the TikTok people. That's getting people fired just for being gay or trans or whatever, oftentimes. But the... I disagree, but okay. Well, I know. But with regards to the, um, the, the activism thing... 99% of the time when I see somebody in academia who was fired for the boldness of the research, they were a shit academic with very strong pre-formed pre, uh, political conceptions that were influencing their work. And they realized they could make more money being a social figure or a public advocate for their political positions than remaining within academia. Jordan Peterson recently did this, an entirely unremarkable man in terms of his academic contributions. He got famous for lying about Bill C-16 in Canada and since then has made his way as a self-help guru. And now, of course, he makes far more money doing that than he ever could acting as a professor. But when he was on his way out, he published a big article about how academia has left him behind and he wasn't allowed to do X or Y and blah -de blah And to be honest, I don't really buy it. It's an origin myth, a creation story. Why are you out here spreading the gospel? Well, it's because academia couldn't handle the truth. Well, what was the truth? And then you look and, well. Um, I think that sociologists and biologists have mostly free reign to determine what they're well, interested you, no, you in can looking at. You can continue what you were saying here. I was hoping that this conversation was going to be cordial, but go. you can go ahead with the point you were making in my case. What were you going to say? Oh, wait, am I speaking about, I'm not speaking about you. I was speaking about Jordan Peterson. I'm, I'm oh, not well, familiar. After, you've, after, after you finished talking about Jordan, I thought you were making a point about me. So oh, not, no, my fine. apologies. I didn't mean to imply that. No, I'm not familiar with the work okay. that you did. I know, I know what you did. I'm not familiar with the actual research you've done. In my experience, it's very difficult to ascertain the sincerity of, uh, um, of, of, of people's claims to that effect with regards to censorship or the effects of political activism or what have you. Now, does it happen? The question to this, the, or the answer is undeniably yes, it does, you know, but... I don't know if it happens along a line or through a pattern substantial enough to, to, to verify the conspiratorial belief that the output of these institutions must be weighted heavily and distorted by the effects of activism, if that makes any sense. 
I mean, I disagree with you. I'm thinking of, of some of the points that you made in your video in terms of, I think there's this perception that for those of us who do go against the orthodoxy and we talk about this and people will say, well, look at the opportunities you're getting. How can you say you've been canceled or silenced because you're still getting these opportunities? You know, for in, in my case, you know, getting to talk on the, the largest podcast in the world. But what goes on behind the scenes, people don't always see that. And I think people don't necessarily see how much harder some of us have to work in order to get those opportunities. Whereas if you were saying the right thing, you wouldn't be losing opportunities or you would be getting more invitations to do things or people would not be afraid to be associated with you. And so I would just ask, I would ask you and I would ask your audience to maybe consider that, that what you see may be the highlight reel of someone's career, right? But it's not necessarily what's going on behind the scenes. And also, um, also many, like there are many things that have happened in my case that I don't talk about publicly just because I'm a private person. And I'm, a, I'm also someone who doesn't want to be seen as complaining because I do feel very lucky to be in the position that I'm in. It's, it's not my intention to be dismissive with regards to that. I know people who have been legitimately fired for what I would consider unjustified grievances from academia, you know. It's only that narrative and the thing that I'm very cautious about is the idea that the product of academic institutions of the research on the subject is invalid because they silence internal dissent. And this is very non-falsifiable from a broad perspective because, of course, we don't actually know the specific reason most people get fired, right? I mean, a lot of it really is up to sort of you had to be there. It's not always easy to ascertain, especially as a non-expert. So when that narrative is constructed, it gives leeway to a lot of really bad subsequent ideas. In terms of where the research is at right now on the trans issue with regards to trans athletics or the sex differences or what have you, I would, I from, from whom I've spoken to, I do believe that the research is legitimately unclouded by political bias. Because in addition to me having spoken with those people and having done a lot of research on race realism, because I argue with neo-Nazis pretty often, you know, that researchers can go about in the modern day publishing like, well, here are the average IQs of different racial groups and not get canceled for it, you know? I think more leeway is given than people think, you know. If anything, the social media space is the one which curtails the greatest degree of fervent cancellation because a lot of the stuff that goes by in academia just ignores public notice. Well, I would say from my experience and the colleagues that I still talk to who are in academia, they they tell me they cannot they cannot pursue this line of research unless it's very, very clear in advance what they're going to find and that it's going to be something that's positive towards trans activism. Well, what, what line? Like what if, if a study was to be done? So you, you alluded earlier about, say, childhood transition. I know that's another area we disagree about. Mm -hmm. any, any study that could potentially, that even looks at the question of what are the outcomes and is it possible that childhood transition may not be beneficial for these kids, right? Because I'm sure you, I've, I've talked about this all the time, how all the research we currently have shows that most kids outgrow their feelings of gender dysphoria. So it makes sense to wait until they reach puberty if they want to make such a decision about transition. I fully support transitioning okay. in adults if that's someone's choice. Do they, do they what? Have well, to wait till well, puberty? The purpose of a pediatric psychiatrist with regards to gender issues would be to determine which cases of gender non-congruity are ones worthy of um, hormone blockers, right? I mean, I I've seen the study that you're referring to, and it it's not as though the sample of gender dysphoric children they were looking at were every kid who had been given puberty blockers. It was every kid who tripped a number of labels for gender non-congruence or discomfort, which is something that's pretty common when you're young. You know, kids are whatever, they're figuring out their identity. But I mean, it's not as though you just go over to the clinic as a 12 year old and they just pop you a bottle of, of hormones, right? You know, you go through rigorous uh, pediatric psychiatric analysis and then maybe you get on hormone blockers. And then of the people who get on hormone blockers, the overwhelming majority decide to go on and take actual hormones to transition later on, which is in large part, I think, because the pediatric psychiatrists do a pretty good job. You know, if you're in there getting appointments for like a year and you're and you're talking to an expert and you're like that grounded, even as a kid on your identity, just not matching your birth sex, that to me seems like, a, you know, it's indicative of nothing else, at least maybe of the validity of puberty blockers. I would argue that 
clinicians cannot do an objective assessment in this climate, especially when they in Canada say they potentially face up to five years in prison if they do not affirm. That really ties a clinician's hands in terms of what types of questions well, they can ask and if they're going to be considered they trying can't do to conversion therapy. deny some. Well, okay. So, but the term conversion therapy, there's a difference between conversion therapy for sexual orientation and gender identity, right? How so? Although I know that they're, they're lumped in together. So conversion therapy for sexual orientation, I don't support because you cannot change someone's sexual orientation. So someone who's gay or bisexual cannot be made to be straight. But when it comes to gender, gender can change, especially in young children who are developing. So if all of the research shows Wait, how, all, so? how 12, I think 11 or 12 studies show that children with gender dysphoria, as they get older and reach puberty, they're more likely to outgrow those feelings than gender why dysphoria would they isn't the same as identifying as the other puberty. gender. Though it could, gender dysphoria isn't the same as identifying as the other gender, though it can. But what we're talking about when we say gender dysphoria, I believe the study was just looking for like incongruence, you know, like a feeling of discomfort. Dysphoria being a more pointed medical term, but with what they were talking can, about. Do you know which study, which study this was? Who I, were the actually? Maybe don't say the authors, but which. I did. I did read it. Um, I don't remember the name of the authors, though. If I had to look it up in Google and look at the methodology, the what I was looking at though, it wasn't post treatment. Like these weren't children selected for um, puberty blockers, right? This was like a sort of pre-sampled list of 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 children with with feelings of gender incongruence. Um, I and think they did transition. They. Or was there, because the problem is with these studies, they also don't have a control group, right? So you won't, you don't know if there are any benefits. If, if, the, if the group of children who transition, they show benefits, you don't know if that's actually due to transition because there isn't a control group of kids with no, gender I think dysphoria they, they didn't who transition. don't transition. And that's that's what the problem is. Well, I, They I didn't transition. Well, well, these are the desistance. Point. You're talking about desistance. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah thank you. Yeah, the, the desistance kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the issue I think that I have with this is that, like, the, you know, that's the point. You say, like, in this environment, a pediatric psychiatrist can't evaluate this. But that comes across as conspiratorial to me because this is, again, that, like, that nefarious political and academic bias prevents all these legitimate institutions and professionals from doing their work. It's like it's non-falsifiable. There's the only real way to debunk that claim would be to read people's minds and the only way to address it would be to change the political environment to one you consider more favorable but i'm in favor of canada's law i don't think that it the place of any psychiatrist if a person let's say a boy goes up to them and says like hey i think i might be a girl for the doctor to go like no actually i think you're not i think you're a boy i think that um research on that has proven that to be a, a very ineffective way of uh, dealing with any underlying issues the best thing that you can do is affirm and try to get underneath it at like uh, any other concerns that might be present and you try to understand the degree to which it's a sincere belief as opposed to a sort of errant or flippant or otherwise unjustified self-perception but do you not think that children can have sincere beliefs and still be wrong? Because my my concern is if a child is blocking, if it's with puberty that they grow to be comfortable with their bodies, why would you block that process? Um, well, first of all, I don't know how common it is for get puberty to make people more comfortable with their bodies. But in but terms that's of what the literature shows in these kids well the literature showed their feelings change but not that puberty and the pubescent changes which took place were the things that alleviated their dysphoria i think for it, in there a was of, a study there was a there was a study that actually showed this and the kids said oh with puberty i grew comfortable in my body and i realized i actually liked it i may not have seen that the earlier study with the the desistance um i, I don't think specifically identified pubescent changes as the cause of those change in feelings because it took place over a length of time but with regards to that um it is possible for a child to be wrong, but like child self-diagnosis on mental issues is something that we have pre-existing care standards for. When a child has like depressive or um, psychosis, you know, like like there are, there are like uh, psychological things up with the kid, you know, mm -hmm. um, self-report, I mean, oftentimes it's the only thing that you can really do. But if you're getting these kids like appointments for years and a professional is able to, you know, bring together like a strong argument, like, yeah, I think this is actually like, you know, and then you get on the puberty blockers and they're reversible and you have some more time to feel however you want about yourself. And right now, the evidence that we have is the majority of people, overwhelming majority, 
who get on puberty blockers transition, and the overwhelming majority of people who transition are happy about it and don't regret it. So it seems like we're on a good track right now. If we get loose with our standards, and it's like kids are getting their uh, hormone blocker skittles like two weeks in or something, you know, and it's just, they're just firing it left and right, then that's, um, uh, yeah, I, I agree there should be a sort of strenuous vetting process, especially for children. Um, but at the moment, it seems like the track is running qu quite well um, and that people are benefiting from it, from the data that we have. But you would claim that they're not allowed to publish data that would make the results look bad. So, it, see, it comes across kind of non-falsifiable. It's like, well, then how could I ever prove the validity of the process, right? I could, I can see that point. I think my perspective is different because, and I have to say, for many of the topics that we've been debating, I very much held your belief previously, you know, and that's part of what made me want to write my book because I thought I totally understand where people are coming from. And I'm definitely very sympathetic to these issues. Like for me, especially, I thought, well, it makes sense for a child if they have gender dysphoria, why wouldn't you want to prevent them from having to undergo this process that's going to create them more distress? But then after I read these studies and I worked in the field, not with children, but just in sex research and doing research around gender and sexual orientation more broadly, realized that, oh, there's a side to this that is not being um, talked about publicly or it's, it's being shunned. And so I, I support transition in pubescent kids. If they do reach puberty and they're uncomfortable still and that, that gender dysphoria persists, then I think that's their business. That's their family's business. And I don't think... Uh, you know, it makes me uncomfortable when um, I, I don't think lawmakers should be getting really involved in that case. But mm -hmm. right now in the climate that we're in, I just I, I see it as really, really difficult, if not impossible for people to do this, make these assessments objectively um, with regard to I don't want to stay on this topic. We're already over time. So My apologies. Um, no, no, that's OK. But I I. With regard to you saying that blockers are, I think you said they're reversible. There With has been research. Two caveats, to my knowledge. Okay, do you want to do you want to say what the caveats are? Oh sure, one is valid, one isn't. Bone density. I know that there can be a, um, a variance in bone density after puberty blockers. That starting on them later, apparently getting on the puberty blockers earlier actually lowers the reduction of bone density, which is counterintuitive. But there's a whole graph that I remember seeing on it. it, it there could be some degree of variance. The other is of IQ, but that I think is, is a, a, a statistic, not statistical, sorry, um, a research error, um, because the IQ variances that we have for the effects of puberty blockers were done on children who had prepubescent puberty, or what do they call it? Early onset puberty, which was right. research done yet. Precocious puberty. Uh, precocious, thank you. Yeah. yeah. 80s and 90s, right? And what they found was that because they were going through precocious puberty, they were experiencing a sudden jump in brain development earlier than a lot of kids of their age, which led to them doing better on IQ scores for their age. When they got on the treatments that mitigated the early um, you know, um, uh, uh, puberty development, because that process slowed, their IQ leveled out as the IQ tests grew more difficult as they grew older and they return to the mean before eventually resuming. So it's not that their IQ dropped, it's that their abnormally fast increase abated as a product of the, but those are the two that I'm aware of. It's bone density and IQ, but the IQ thing I don't think is, is a concern. It's also not possible for us to say it's causation because like I said, with these studies, they're, they aren't randomly assigning the kids into treatment versus non-treatment. And there isn't a control group of kids with gender dysphoria who don't undergo the, tra the treatment. So any, any of these studies with, with kids with gender dysphoria, they're always going to be given the treatment because it's seen unethical to withhold treatment from them. So my point in saying that is that we can't say any of this is causal. But um, there was another study that showed in an animal model that, that spatial memory is affected. My concern with all this is just, I think, it, on the same page as you, I think research needs to be objective. There should not be any uh, intimidation involved, any coercion. Research should not feel scared for their careers as a result. I know that you're skeptical as, as to whether that's the case, but from my perspective, that's where I'm coming from with this. And then the other point I wanted to make was with regard to detransition. So one of the young I interviewed for my book, she said that she was able to access cross-sex hormones with one one-hour appointment. And I do think the number of detransitioners is growing. My sense is you would disagree with that. 
Well, I think the number is going to grow because the number of trans people is going to grow for sure. That had to be an adult, right? There's no way one hour appointment for like a kid that would have had to be uh, an adult, correct? I can't remember her age. I think it's in my book. I think she was, I don't know if I want to say, let me, let me. You, oh yeah, you, yeah, you don't have to, to specify, but just curious because I, I know at least here in the U.S. the protocol is very strict in, in a lot of respects for like the refer, the referring of this to the, I know they can do it in 16 in the U.K. because that's their age of maturity. Um, you know, 16 year olds are babies, but yeah. You know, um, I believe in, I believe in your country because I'm Canadian as oh, it can be 15 in some states. I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know you were Canadian. I mean, uh, I'd, I'd have to look into the, the, um, oh, it could be the uh, medical age of consent. I know the uh, medical yeah. age of consent is different from the age of majority, whatever the case may be with regards to detransition, um, detransitioning is relatively rare. The data we have on, um, the effects of cross-sex hormones and surgery is, is quite positive from everything that I've seen. It doesn't mean detransitioning is not something to be looked at. It's worth noting that from the studies I've seen, the majority of people who are detransitioning are doing so not because they're not the identity they transitioned into, but because of social or medical barriers preventing them. I believe there's a breakdown. Um, I think this one's actually on, on Wikipedia where one of the, um, there, a, a study was done and it was some, something like 80 to 90% of the people detransitioning who listed why it was because lack of support, um, you know, uh, medical barriers, not enough money, which is heartbreaking. Uh, that being said, there are going to be people who, I guess we would call it like a proper detransition. Like, you know, they fully, they're like, oh wait, no, never mind, you know, fully back. And I think those people should be afforded the exact same degree of medical and social care and support as I would for trans people or as anyone else should for trans people. Um, because that's gotta be incredibly difficult too, you know. It is a very strenuous, uh, strenuous process, at least for young people at the moment, to transition. I think that it's a decision that should not be made lightly, but invariably with anything like this, there are going to be people calling taxis backsies. And I think that, you know, uh, uh, that's unfortunate. It's also inevitable and we should do everything we can to make those people's lives good, the detransitioners. And I agree with you that if someone is detransitioning because they can't access care or if it's because of stigma, I don't think that's good. And I think that we should be more um, more compassionate and supportive in that case. But if you look at the research that has been published on detransitioners, many of them will say it's because they had internalized homophobia. So many of them say for the individuals born female, are lesbian, they're not comfortable with the fact that they're attracted to women. Um, so they wanted to transition to male because they felt that'd be more socially acceptable to be a man who is sexually interested in women, or it's because of sexual trauma. So as again, women having experienced sexual abuse or sexual assault and not feeling comfortable with their bodies or being dissociated from their bodies and wanting to escape that. Um, is other, this that like, Abigail autism, Schreier thing? What was that one book? Um, Abigail Schreier's book. Schreier, was it Schreier? Well, was, was, is it, it I don't, the... I don't, wanna, yeah, I don't want to speak for Abigail. I'll speak. I do talk about this research in my book as well. It's Lisa Lippman's research, hmm. and it shows that there are, in terms of rapid onset gender dysphoria, the reasons why young women are so quickly gravitating to this label of wanting to be transgender or non-binary, and living as men, only to change their mind event later once. Once there comes, I think, a greater understanding or self-acceptance of whatever the underlying reason for them wanting to take on that identity was, which is not to say that trans men don't exist or that trans people don't exist, of course. And I'm also, I, I try to be very mindful and responsible when I talk about this because I do recognize that there are some people who will say, well, because some people change their mind and detransition, then why should we let anybody transition at all? But I don't agree with that. I do think it's important, though, to talk about what's happening right now with this, in terms of this population, because they are making some decisions that may not ultimately be good for them. It's tearing families apart. The parents, the, this is another um, area that you might be skeptical of, but I hear from so many parents who are saying they can't talk to their kids. Their kids are essentially, you know, being protected by the state. They cannot, they ha don't have any say in, in terms of their care. And for a parent, I mean, that's terrifying, I'm sure. I totally get that. 
I do want to say, though, with regards to a counterpoint, is that Littman's research is uh, utterly without integrity and shouldn't be trusted. The term rapid onset gender dysphoria came from a study where Littman did a question survey of moms who frequented websites oriented around parents of trans children who didn't like the fact that their children were trans. Uh, a psychiatric evaluation into a group being done by polling their disapproving parents is like the bad joke version of how you would do a sociological study. I think that the fact that that study got published and worse, peer reviewed, is like actually a bigger uh, strike against the legitimacy of academia than anything else I've ever heard, including that that James Lindsay lets publish those so-and-so fake sociological articles to prove how bad the discipline is. Oh God, the um, the uh, the idea that for the like, record, I thought James's investigation was brilliant, but we we disagree on that. And I I'll think talk he's, about Lisa's work as well. But I go think ahead. he's alone, and he's been running for me. But I'll get I'll get him one of these days. Uh, the um, with regards to the 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 Lippman stuff, um, that just I, I I this isn't this isn't a study even worth considering. It's 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 a psychiatric evaluation by polling disapproving parents. You might as well get like a an evaluation on race and IQ by pulling like white, uh, you know, Southern, um, like, uh, um, what are they called? Country club members. You know, it's just, it's just meaningless in terms of like where these, um, why can people... I make a point about the, about the parents before you move to your next? Sure. Point? But you, you have to, you have to recognize, of course, that a psychiatric evaluation done by pulling disapproving parents is it's a ridiculous way to conduct like, so the parents say that, you know, it was because of internalized homophobia. How could you possibly, I mean, sure, they could say that, perhaps, but of, of what relevance is that to actual scientific inquiry? But I don't think it's fair to label these parents as transphobic because many of them would say they didn't care whether their child was trans or not. They didn't care about the outcome. And many of them are very, were in the study, it says that they were very much in favor of equal rights for gay people and for gay marriage. And many of them, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but were self-identified as democrats so these are these are not parents yeah, who this, are anti-trans this is indefensible research the the three well the, the researcher Littman literally went out of their way looking for websites which are opposed in some way to trans whether it, they always say this right it's like well i was a democrat a lot of these people are turfs you know a lot of these people were okay well i would say turf were, is a slur but turf is absolutely not a slur it's not a discriminatory characteristic uh it's only a smear against a person's political affiliation which i mean you might as well say nazi is a slur if we're going down that road i mean i do mean it with all negativity intended but not a slur nothing against women there are turf men that i've talked to and they're fun too um anyway no just i just don't i don't know why that label is necessary i feel like we can have the discussion without having to insult it's, it's what they are. I, I could call them transphobes, which they also are, which I would also well, that's also an negative. insult, right? Well, right. Well, you can't say turf is a slur. Yeah, it's an insult, sure. But I find their positions insulting. They exist in a manner which I think hurts marginalized people. It's, I mean, we, you wouldn't take an issue with somebody being called racist if they were racist, right? But racist is more of a descriptive term, whereas transphobic or I feel like any, any um, disagreement with this narrative gets you labeled as something disparaging. This I don't is think also race... what racists say when you impose the narrative of racial equality on them. I mean, this is that's what everyone says, right? It's like, well, you, you're insulting me by accusing me of being bigoted, and I'm not bigoted. I'm only disagreeing with this new trend. Well, that's what every bigoted group is But saying. this goes to my, my point earlier of, is it possible to be critical of trans ideology without, would, does that necessarily mean that you hate trans people? Um, no, you can be critical. I'm actually, pre I argue with trans people all the time on my platform. Um, there are plenty of, but of, that's why I disagree with calling things transphobic because to me, you when you call something exist? transphobic, no, I, I think it exists, but I think it's it, many things that are not coming from a place of hating trans people are being lumped in as being hateful. So it's not about hate. Bigotry doesn't have to be about hate. There are plenty of people who don't hate black people who are nonetheless racist. But if you take a look at, so right now, the site, Youth Crit Trans Critical Professors, or Professionals, is uh, private. But it, on Transgender Trend and Fourth Wave Now, you'll see plenty of things. Hate is certainly one of them, but that's not the predominant trend. The most you're going to see is uh, 
a sort of contemptuous paternalistic disapproval of the effect that trans ideology is having on the youth. But again, a psychiatric profile being done of trans people by pulling their parents who disapprove of them being trans is wholly unworthy research. The opinions of those moms are worth literally less than nothing. I mean, it would be, again, like a profile on interracial marriage done by disapproving white fathers with a, from, the, from suburbs in the 1960s. It's like, well, I don't, oh, I why? don't feel like these comparisons to race are apt, though, because the concerns about gender, there are, like in this case, this is, to me, this is a legitimate, not to me, this is a legitimate study. She, Lisa Littman should have been allowed to ask this question. There's this phenomenon of people transitioning very quickly out of the blue, no previous history of gender dysphoria. Why is that not a legitimate question to ask? And to, how is that considered you similar to racism? conduct a psychological profile on a minority group by polling their disapproving parents. This is, this is matter of factly ridiculous. If it was, but just, she doesn't even. She's not saying this is a psychological profile. She, it, I believe, she. I don't want to speak for her, but I believe in the paper she acknowledges that this is not a clinical diagnosis. She's just doing a descriptive study, which is it's very a typical. Descriptive study on the psychological profile of these childrens vis-a-vis their parents' report. That's where you just pulled the um, internalized homophobia thing, which I think is bunk. By that the way, that was a second study. That's oh, that was not that study. That was a second study. Oh, they both pull it then. It's a common narrative that I disagree with, though. The idea, like. Um, like the idea that a person wants to avoid the stigma of being gay so they transition i'm sure it's happened it actually funnily enough in this in, in iran um the state will actually subsidize transition because it seems they're okay with trans people but they're not okay with homosexuality so if you're a homosexual man they'll they'll have you you can transition to a woman and you can have a heterosexual relationship it's not exactly ideal but it's just an interesting tidbit that, that would sort of play out in that way um, so, but what would, what would make our culture different? What would make North America different? We stigmatize trans people more than we do gay people um, in, a, in a great many do ways. Do you think in this moment that's still true though? Yeah. God, wait. Yeah, absolutely. Also, it's way easier to be gay than to be trans. I'm gay. I'm not trans. You know, being gay is as easy as, as which bars you could. It's not even that, you know, I'm being, I'm being uh, facetious, but you can, you know, the gay lifestyle, if anyone wants to call it that, you know, that's easy peasy. You can drop in and out transitioning. Oh my God, it's expensive and time consuming and you lose a bunch of your friends if they're not on board. The idea that people would do this flippantly, don't get me wrong. It happens, I'm sure. Take a large enough group of people and eventually somebody's going to do something like that. But is there like a statistical concern of people doing it flippantly to avoid the internalized feelings of shame they have over their homosexuality? I don't, from what I've seen, that doesn't seem to be the case. It, it seems at the very least counterintuitive to me. I mean, you would acknowledge that being trans is, is a lot harder than being gay, wouldn't you? I think it is definitely much more um, of a, in, in terms of the process of transition, yes. I'm someone who grew up in the gay community. I'm straight, but I have had so many of my friends say to me that, if they were growing up now, they think they would have transitioned to female as gay men. Well, I mean, a lot of people, JK Rowling said that. I feel like a lot of people project their personal, you know, biases onto that until it bears out in existing research. I suppose we'll have to see. I mean, some some of the people but who it said is, that and to the, might do you be transition closeted. In that study that I said, these girls are transitioning because they're not comfortable with being lesbian. They say that. I would need to take a look at that study then. I, that one specifically I haven't seen, but I'd be interested. I can um, send it. I'll, I'll send it to you. Okay, I'd be delighted. Thank you. Um, you know, barring my evaluation of that particular study, uh, whatever data we do have, and again, I can't speak to the idea that some data is not being published or investigated thoroughly enough because it might procure bad results. But from the data we have, detransition isn't common. And when it happens, it's usually because of social stigma or medical barriers. Um, at the end of the day, when we're talking about, you know, the existence of detransitioning people, we're just going to have to accept that their existence is an inevitable complement to the existence of people who medically transition. There's no way to have a medical procedure undertaken by so many people without some people looking to undo it in some fashion. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take an effort to minimize the number of people who unduly transition or to be supportive of detransitioners. It only means that I wish that their experiences wouldn't be sort of weaponized in a campaign to raise concerns over the extent to which we gatekeep people right now from transitioning. Most people agree 
at least in the trans community, the gatekeeping as it stands is too significant. So it seems like, if anything, we need to go in the opposite direction. I agree that I don't think the issue of detransitioning should be weaponized against trans people. I don't agree with that. Um, I, but I think it goes back to the, the point I made earlier about clinical, just people, clinicians feeling like they, they can't do their jobs properly. But um, I want to just let you have a chance to say, is there anything that you wanted to bring up? Because I know that we're over on time right now. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, oh, goodness. Well, we are. Time flies when you're, when you're having fun. Um, <laughs> well, I, I took a snipe of James Lindsay earlier, of course, which, you know, hardly my first. I saw some of your conversation uh, with him. And yeah, um, he was on, I just said for people listening, he was on episodes 39 and 40. He was also on my podcast earlier on talking about different subjects, but more recently we're talking about political grooming um, and sexual grooming in schools. Yeah, that. Speaking of a lack of evidence, um, for, from what I say, and, and to your credit, by the way, you say this, you know, in, in that conversation, but comprehensive sex education improves the lives of, of young people in basically every way, like in terms of use of contraception, lower pregnancy rates when you're young, and from the research that exists, which isn't much, unfortunately, but from what does exist, re, um, programs like that significantly reduce the amount of pedophilic predation against young people. You point this out too, you know, it's much easier to call out stuff like that if you know broadly what's happening, you know, it, you know, in, in, in ignorance, uh, predation reigns, but when young people uh, have, have terminology they can use to describe what's happened to them or whatever, you know, grim stuff like that. But the weaponization of, of these terms, I mean, you say political grooming. I have no idea what that means. In terms of actual grooming, you know, like the actual proper term for it, um, there's just no evidence of this being in any way correlated to like woke, like elementary school teachers or whatever. It's just another like big fear mongering bit. But I, I guess I just... If you acknowledge that these comprehensive sex education programs are wholly beneficial, what's the concern? So uh, I, I'm trying to think how to best summarize this because I don't want to speak for James. I have to say that that conversation definitely changed my perspective on many um, of, of how I feel about this issue because as a former sex researcher, I've always been very much in favor of sex education. I think it's very important. Um, and like you said, comprehensive sex education, I've always publicly been a, a big defender of it. Um, but after talking to James, I realized that what is being taught in the classroom today is not reflective of these programs that were previously helpful to kids. And like you said, helping them have just proper names for their anatomy so that kids are able to protect themselves and they can acknowledge or identify when abuse is happening so they can report it. But now it started to work in these ideas that are nonsensical and are a way of separating children from their parents in terms of the way they, they see the world. They have these particular views about sexuality and gender. And Before. it's a way of like, like pretty much everything we've talked about in this conversation, things like gender fluidity that, um, children can be what don't let's not talk about boys and girls because if you are a little girl you may not really be a little girl i mean that the possibility that someone a child is going to grow up to be a transgender adult is so statistically small and i just don't think it's appropriate to be talking to kids about this stuff because it's very confusing for young children i think if well if it's being taught to kindergartners yes i think up until even say I would say even close to puberty. I mean, kids, kids, their conception of gender is so malleable, developmentally speaking. It's just not, it makes me question. I mean, do you wonder why do you, why would a teacher feel that this is so important to teach a child? And if they are, so I don't really want to get too much into the, to Florida's parental rights bill, but don't the, the outrage well. around that, pardon? It's just the don't say gay bill. Yeah. I was making sure right. that well, I had the that's, same one. Right. That's what it's being called by some people, but it does prevent you from uh, talking about sexuality of which, of which sexual, gay is one. Yeah. Right. But no, but it's about teachers teaching this in their curriculum for kids, kindergarten to grade three. And for 
um, precluding parents from those discussions. That's what the bill is. You can uh, say gay. There's fine. nothing about no, this thing. There's nothing about saying gay. You can say gay all you want. It's about specifically teaching kids these ideas. So why are these educators so upset that they can't do that? So a couple why is that of, so important? Well, first of all, the don't say gay bill is borderline unconstitutional. It's a restriction of First Amendment and educational rights. So I, I feel like it's it's this isn't really just like a woke left thing. Like there's a reason the entire Democratic Party has condemned it as well. Um, it's it's you know not particularly. It's not just so. First of all, it prohibits in curriculum, uh, you know, the um, instruction of anything pertaining to sexuality or gender. But there isn't a very strong legal definition for curriculum as opposed to just classroom discussion. And from the way the libs of TikTok Twitter account and all of its subsidiaries are acting, it seems like just bringing up the existence of gay or trans people constitutes political grooming to a lot of these types. And then you have the fact that all uh, I, I just want to say for libs of TikTok, because I know that that you've mentioned them a couple times in this conversation that I don't I don't want to speak for them. I know I just I don't want to speak for them. because I don't know. I don't know them and I don't know what their intentions are. So I think it's just fair to to say that much right we don't we don't know we can't really attribute motive to them because we don't know we know they're a far-right political operative whose goal seems to be to paint a bunch of trans and gay and gender non-conforming people who work in education as groomers in spite of the vast majority of the people they outline of course there's no actual evidence of any grooming taking place it seems like a very cheap and cynical politicization of the word personally um uh, anyway, to, to speak to the broader point here, the issue that I have. But if you're teaching, if you're teaching kids nonsensical ideas about gender and sexuality, with the goal of of making them woke, is that not a form? It may not be sexual grooming, but it is that not political grooming? There's no such thing as political grooming. Political perspectives inform our biases everywhere we go at all times, and they have been in this, education forever. There's no such thing as political grooming. I don't think it's been in education forever. I don't think all politics? teachers have always been political and always imposing their politics on kids with the goal of turning those children in the same direction that they're in. With respect, that's a very ahistorical perspective. The curriculum of the United States, the educational curriculum, has always been informed by people who are making a deliberate effort to instill certain values, whether it be patriotism, whether it be subservience to the state, whether the curriculum be oriented around making people good factory workers or service workers, there's always been a political bias. And the political um, or progressive inclinations of the time have always had an influence as well. Obviously, you know, people were getting these same accusations back in the 1960s. Um, and likewise, you were getting a lot of this back in the 1920s as well with the suffragette movement when there were political activists who also happened to work as educators there was this renewed fear-mongering about them being you know you know they're trying to indoctrinate young boys to be submissive to females or whatever nonsense they would say back then um uh, uh, but do you not think there are some teachers who would go into teaching saying you know my politics it's not my place to put my politics on my students is that can... not an admirable way to go about teaching Depends if your students politics. don't know what your political if it but i don't think it should matter about someone's politics i think regardless of left or right you shouldn't be imposing those those aren't your children racial it's equality not your place but that's not a is that a political value that is absolutely a political position yeah 100 percent. see this is the problem that i have you you say you claim you don't like politics and x or y but you only label politics the current zeitgeist the current culture or discourse and everything prior to that all the battles that have been fought and won in centuries past those aren't politics anymore it's just accepted that's not true racial equality was they literally had to send the national guard in to protect the little rock nine when they were being integrated in uh, what was it alabama uh, th this was this was just two generations ago. The we are not far off from the idea of racial equality being taught in class being a legitimately politically subversive okay, idea. Okay, this I feel we should have another discussion about the topic of race because that's a whole other thing, and we are over time right now. But right, I appreciate I'm sorry. you. Yeah, I appreciate you with with your perspectives, and there's so much more I think that we could obviously talk about. But um, do you do you want to share any final thoughts with my audience before we say goodbye? Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, to, to, to cap off that point, I guess I just want to say that like where we invest our energy is very important. And as any person interested in sort of uh, scientific and rational consistency, 
you know, would adhere to, you need to follow where the data goes. And right now, the data of there being some grooming epidemic in schools, well, hold on, that's actually a problem, but it has nothing to do with woke anything. That's just a problem with teachers. The big, the two big places where child grooming happens is in the home and in the church, you know, but Republicans want to focus on the school and coincidentally only on the Do you think it's happening doing- in the school at all? Would you acknowledge it's happening at all? Of course, but actually child sexual predation has been going down over time as wokeness levels rise. I just don't think there's a correlation. I don't think that like- I'd need to see that study. <laughs> in terms of sexual predation over time. Oh yeah, it used to be way more common with than wokeness, With wokeness? Well, I can tell if you're being facetious. I just mean that like progressivism, we've only gotten more progressive with time and social issues here in the States, but the amount of child predation that's been recorded has been going down ever since we started tracking stuff like that. And I think the mid 20th century, like the reported instances of child abuse have gone down and down and down in large part because our society is more integrated with the internet. People have easier access to info that can let them know if abuse is taking place. Uh, Stuff like Me Too, it sounds silly, but it does actually get people sort of invested in the mindset that they should report if abuse is happening. You know, and that's good. The less child abuse is happening, the the better, you know, but I, I strongly disagree with this cynical weaponization of the term grooming. Grooming is a serious thing to do. And it's being applied to like teachers I who feel are doing it's no different from dances. nazis but go ahead go ahead i don't want to cut you off go ahead uh well if they were calling all these teachers nazis i would disagree with that too but like there are people getting called groomer some teacher lost his job because he said like it, to any trans kids who were rejected by your parents i love you the idea of a teacher saying i love my students i think is... he said like i'm your parent now right isn't that the same guy oh yeah the idea I don't that think that's, that's appropriate. <laughs> I don't think there's anything remotely inappropriate. Do you understand? About that. Could you see why parents might be uncomfortable at that? I don't care. This if is they're... one specific. This is one specific case. So I'm saying more broad. This is not. This is this is one case we're talking about, but it's I think is indicative of something larger that's happening. The comfort of the parents is not a determining factor in the validity of an educational protocol. If we defer to that, then we'd have Christian fundamentalists suing every school district in America every time evolution is brought up. I mean, we've been down this road, right? Parents have a right to determine the education of their children. When they're at home, when they're at a public school, it is up to the institution of the public school. And I think that's a fair and fine thing um, because, you know, regardless of, you know, how many TikToks of woke teachers or whatever, you know, for the most part, public education it does a, a consistent job. I want I, I can't say good because American education sucks. So I can I keep trying to say good, but it's not, you know, it's, it does a bad, but nonetheless consistent job of instilling, you know, very certain educational premises. The idea that everyone's walking out of public education being some sort of woke bot is not true. If you actually care about your students, like, or your kids being woke, you want to get them off the internet. The internet is full of access points to very progressive spaces um you could just isolate them and like homeschool them i guess but um the world is getting more progressive i think this is a good thing that should be celebrated you know um even if it leads sometimes to cringy teachers doing like tiktok dances while talking about how they're teaching their second grade students how the gender binary is fake like okay like do i do i think that's like appropriate for second graders i don't know if inappropriate is the word i use more like stupid i, I just don't know if there's a point in it for for me, it should be like, if you're talking with kids, it's like, oh yeah, you know, sometimes people are straight, sometimes they're not. Oh yeah, sometimes people are, they're, they're born as boys, they stay boys, sometimes they stay girls, But that's whatever. a problem because it's teaching kids now, like we see the lawsuits that are happening, right? Where there are kids, there are girls who are transitioning behind their parents' back. The parents don't know. And, and in some cases, these kids are attempting suicide and the parents are, were completely kept out of the equation. So that that to me is Wait, where my concern lawsuit? is coming Wait, from. Wait, what does that have to do? Who's being sued there? This, the school boards are being sued. What what did they what did they do if the, the, ki- the kids because are the transitioning? Teachers, the teachers were withheld the information from the parents. And in some cases, this is where to me the grooming aspect comes in. They were the ones coaching the kids to take on these identities. Anyway, if you want to come back on another time, I'll have you back on. How sure. Yeah. I'm sorry. We keep running over. My apologies. <laughs> I just have to ask to, though. How many last hours, thing. I think, yeah. Just last thing. Yeah. I swear to God. No, no, no. Would you say the same thing if like a kid disclosed they were gay, like they had homophobic parents and they told a teacher like, Hey, I think I'm gay, but I can't tell my parents because my parents would beat the shit out of me. And the teacher's like, Oh, that's okay. You live your life, you know? And then later that kid like attempted suicide because of social pressure and the school district got sued by the parents. Like, do you think that'd be a legit lawsuit? Like, is that grooming or is that just 
So I've thought about that. And I think in that case, the teacher who's being told that the child is in an abusive situation should report that to the authorities. I don't think it should be the teachers. It, I don't think it's appropriate for the teacher to be the one keeping secrets from with the child in any, any, or having a special relationship with the child. That to me is a huge red flag, whether or not someone has the intention of it being a sexual relationship, it could become a step down that way, or it could maybe not, but I just don't think it's appropriate for people in positions of power to be having secrets with children. But, Do you agree? Well, not, not really. I mean, when I was in school, you know, I, I didn't even know I was gay back then, but like uh, uh, te good teachers can be like another like calming authority figure in your life. You spend a whole year with them when you're young. And th if there's like advice they have, you know, don't get me wrong. The secret relationship is kind of a loaded term. Like we're talking a wide range here. If a kid discloses something, you know, if, if there's no avenue to report to the police abuse, I mean, if you report it to the police, then what? Like they show up at the house and it gets made public and the kid gets beaten within an inch of their life after the police find that there's nothing they can officially charge the parents with because there's no evidence for like, yeah, I don't know. Like, it well, seems I mean, like that'd but be a that's lot of way extreme. to get people hurt. That's an extreme. I think it should at least be, I mean, if, if you want to talk about what should be done in that case, I just don't think there are situations, and I think most adults who are put in that position probably would be uncomfortable to say, I don't feel right that a child's telling me something and I have to keep this a secret. They should want to at least, I think, put if they if they are concerned about the child's well-being to put some sort of precautionary measures. Sometimes just place, having right? a person to disclose to can be hugely beneficial for the suicidality of queer youth, you know, like the feeling they don't have to keep it hidden from absolutely everyone if they know they have a supportive teacher. I just don't think that leads to group like parents will groom their kids I just kids think there's a too, potential so there it's... for it to be abused, right? There is a potential there for it to be abused. True, but if any standard... If we're normalizing standard... the, the, the secrets between teachers and kids. Well, any standard parents. where any relationship between like people in a position of power and children can be harmful would include parents, right? I mean, parents, I'm pretty True. sure the household's the number one grooming central, grooming station, you know, uh, eight lines on that, uh, on, on that union station. So it just seems like a sort of weird imbalance, especially since the only thing this is getting focused on is queer issues. Like, it at the end of the day, look, if a kid is transitioning or like thinks they're a boy or a girl, you know, whatever, and they don't feel comfortable telling their parents, um, the abuser, as far as I'm concerned, is the parents. Uh, any environment in which a child can't even voice concerns like that or like questions or interests with their parents, talk it out, uh, is one in which um, that, as far as I'm concerned, that child's already being abused teacher being disclosed to in that case is just probably a modicum of relief for the student that they don't have to hide everything from everyone. But I'll take a look at the details of the lawsuit. It just seems to me like a lot of this is misdirected anger at trans people trying to be weaponized against institutions that can be sued because you can't sue every trans kid. Um, anyway. Yeah, there, there have been multiple lawsuits. Can I just say before we say goodbye, I just ask for people listening who may not be familiar with my work to please read The End of Gender. You can get it free on Audible. The audiobook is read by me so that you know what my positions are. I feel that much of the criticism I get is people who have not read my book, have not read my work. It's based on things that other people have said about me, which in many cases are not true or are not accurate reflections of my, my opinions on these issues. So I just ask that. And um, I really thank you for coming on my podcast. I feel like there's something more you want to say. <laughs> there's always something more I want to say. Don't tell me that. Don't give me permission. Um, <laughs> I appreciate I appreciate you having me on. Seriously, it's been a good time. Sorry for running over. That's all right. All right. Well, thank you so much. So we, we talked about I'm going to be releasing this in a few days. And uh, all right. Take care.